All right, fantastic. Let's go give some prize money, okay? Let's do this. You got everything, Janet? Got it. Okay, let's go. Welcome to NASA Edge. An inside and outside look. At all things NASA. Hey, we're at the Bragg Farm in Tony, Alabama, just north of Huntsville. For the Mars Ascent Vehicle, or MAV prize. Which is part of the student launch initiative. And for this event, the prize is a lot of money. I tell you what, this is the first time we've covered this event and you're in for a treat. Yeah, we've been here all week watching students prepare, go through reviews and put their rockets together, take them apart, rebuild them. And it's now time to see them launch. Let's go check out the action. It is great to see the kids out in full force today. And, and the weather is perfect for launching rockets. And recovering them. NASA has been conducting student launch for a number of years, but this year they're adding a twist. They're adding the Centennial Challenges MAV Prize. And that is the focus of this show. So, not all teams launching rockets today are actually competing for the MAV Prize. For the teams that are, they have to complete a very specific set of tasks. And to get paid, I mean to really receive the cash award, these teams need to demonstrate their fully functional automated ground support equipment, or AGSE. Right, Franklin. And these teams have been doing this throughout the week at various locations here in Alabama, some right up to launch time today. This process is known as the Launch Readiness Review and involves each team showing the judges that their system can autonomously retrieve a sample cache, stow it in a payload compartment on their rocket, seal the rocket, deploy the rocket to a vertical launch condition, and insert the igniter. For safety reasons, these demonstrations will be done without the motors present in the rocket, because you know we don't want any trouble. <laughs> you got that right. And when out on the range and ready to launch, the rockets must launch to 3,000 feet, eject their payload on descent at 1,000 feet, and return both the payload and rocket components safely to Earth. Simple, really. If you're rocket geniuses like these students are, Chris, students had an opportunity to do their launch readiness review early or save it and do it a little later. You guys actually went first. How was that experience? It was pretty nerve-wracking, but uh, it went well. We didn't have any issues. Worked on the first try, and it went very fast. Faster than most times we had done it before, so we were very happy with it. So you guys were pretty confident coming in that your system was ready to go. We were. It was, there was no work on it once we got here. It was just resetting it up and everything worked as we expected it to. Have you tweaked it any since you got here? Since we got here, no. It's not broke, don't fix it. Exactly. So Chris, a lot of teams here are encountering autonomy for the first time. What special things has your team done to work with that part of the process? Yeah, so uh, our initial design for uh, closing our sample inside of our hatch of our rocket was a, a very complicated electronic design where we had a door sliding down on a gear rack using some electronic servos. And as we were starting to build that design, we realized that there might be a more simple way to go about it. We realized that the robotic arm that we're using to lift the sample into our hatch could just as easily be used to close the hatch itself with a little flick of the wrist. And that little modification to the robotic arm code saved us a lot of time and effort and ended up working out really well for us. So you have an air brake system on your rocket. Tell me a little bit about that. Yes, so the air brake system consisted of four fins, actually. They're cut out from the body tubes so that they sit flush with our rocket, and it's used with an Arduino using altitude sensors and a Fergelli linear actuator, and that pushes the fins out, causes more drag to help us reach the 3,000 feet altitude that we need to hit. So John, tell me about how you use 3D printing in the manufacturing of your rocket. Well, one of the things we really wanted to cut down on was machining time. So by using 3D printing, we're able to keep ourselves out of the machine shop, cat it up, let the printer do the work, and we can continue on with other things. But one of the ideas we had was that normally in rocketry, the fin can and the assembly itself is all one piece. So if you break a fin, you have to replace the entire thing. What we've done is made a 3D printed fin can with replaceable fins. So essentially, if one of the fins breaks, we can just pop it out and pop in a new one. Also, along with that, if it's a windy day, we want to put smaller fins on, can slide those in, bigger fins. This gives us a lot of range. The innovations we're seeing here today are awesome. 
But we've also seen that many of the teams have actually struggled getting all the elements of their rockets and more importantly, their AGSE to work throughout the week. Hey, remember, this is not easy. We're talking about a centennial challenge. And that's why NASA's awarding big money to the teams that meet and exceed these challenges. Exactly. Earlier, I had a chance to talk with Sam Ortega about the development of the math prize. Sam, what is the Centennial Challenge program and why did NASA start it back in 2005? Well, that's a good question, Chris. The Centennial Challenges program started back in 2005, like you said. It was around the time of the Wright Brothers' Centennial of Flight anniversary. Right. So the Wright Brothers, two bicycle makers, built an airplane. That is the most unexpected source of innovation that you could have expected for as a solution of heavier than air flight. So that's what we're looking for with the Centennial Challenges program is we want to find people who can solve technology hurdles or remove technology hurdles that NASA has. And we want to look for that from the unconventional sources. We're looking for hackers, makers, citizen scientists, citizen inventors, hobbyists, pretty much anywhere. We're willing to see if they can help solve some problems to help us do space exploration. All right, well, who defines those technological problems that NASA is looking for? So NASA has set up their technology roadmaps. So we have a, a plan for what technology we need to achieve our future missions and our future vision and goals. We'll look through those. We'll also look to some of the organizations that are outside of the agency, technical organizations, associations, some of our partners that are commercial space explorers. And we'll look to them to get ideas and see what kind of technologies they're looking for and try to merge the two together. So it's something that NASA needs, it's something that the nation needs, and then we'll go formulate a prize or develop a prize competition focused around those type of ideas. And so now we get schools, we get all the people that we'd listed earlier, they have all these opportunities to show us the technology they have. So with only holding up one prize value, we might get 20, 30 people competing. We get to look and see 20 or 30 different technology solutions and then we have the option of going and working with them to try to infuse that technology, infuse that intellectual property into NASA to take advantage of it. Now, you looked at all the different rockets and different, different innovations this past week. What are some thoughts that, that, that you've seen so far? So as always with our Centennial Challenges, I'm always impressed with the ingenuity and the solutions that a lot of the competitors come up with. We have some of our competitors are just using the resources they have around their hometown or their home place. Right. Some of them are using farm equipment, which is kind of fitting here at Bragg Farm. Yeah, absolutely. So kind of perfect. Then some of them are, are using high tech, they're 3D printing the parts for the rocket or using composite materials. So we're seeing the whole spectrum of technology. And more importantly, we're seeing the solution ideas or the processes that they're coming up with. And that's what we're really excited to see with this map challenge. I don't know if you could tell, but Sam was totally stoked about seeing the AGSE demonstrated and seeing if these rockets can be successfully launched. I think that's fair. He, he is pretty enthusiastic. Well, it's the first year of the MAV Prize, but you have to remember that they are working closely with the student launch, which has been working with students and inspiring young rocket scientists for years. I had a chance to talk to two of the busiest people you'll see at this event, Julie Clift and Katie Wallace, and they talked all about how this got started. Katie, Julie, glad you're here. I know that your voice is uh, struggling after keeping everything in line, but we're here for Student Launch. Tell us about Student Launch. Right, Student Launch is an activity that we've been doing for 15 years. The idea of Student Launch is to take all the math science knowledge that the students have learned in the classroom and apply it to an engineering challenge. And that's what we're doing today. We actually challenge the students to build and launch a rocket to meet certain specifications. Now, you say students, but this is a kind of a broad range. We're talking about a lot of varying ages among our students. What's the, what are the parameters for the competition? Right, we have three components this year. We've got middle school and high school. We've also got college and university. And at the college and university level, we have two different challenges. One's a little bit more challenging than the other. So we've got a broad range for anybody who wants to participate. Awesome, and even last night, I guess you guys were already giving awards away, so tell us a little bit about that. Um, yes, um, wh what you're seeing here is the culmination of Student Launch, but it's really eight months of long, hard work. And so last night, we gave out awards for best project requirements. We also give out a website award because one of the things they do is they develop a website to tell the public about what they're doing. Gotta share what you're doing. And along with that, they also have to engage other students in education. They reach out to elementary schools, high schools, and so we give an educational engagement award. And then there are also some peer awards. We had our rocket fair yesterday where they get to share with all the Marshall employees everything they've done for the past eight months. And we give out awards like best looking rocket, most team spirit, and best rocket fair demonstration. Awesome. Well, we're looking forward to a lot of great launches today.
Blair, we've seen a lot of rockets launched and a lot of successful recoveries so far today. As I said, these kids are geniuses. Or is it genii? Man, don't get wrapped around a grammatical axle. I'll tell you one thing, the successes you're seeing right now weren't apparent earlier in the week. So what you're saying is that rocket science is difficult even for geniuses? Exactly. And the students can tell you all about it. All right, Michael, I understand you've overcome quite a few technical difficulties since you've arrived in Alabama. What, 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 what happened? So our entire system runs on a series of five Arduino microcontrollers, little small computer chips that drive everything. We need a minimum of five of them to run everything. We brought nine just in case something happened. Somehow on the flight over here, all but three of them broke. So we've spent the last three days staying up all night around the clock, rewiring and reprogramming everything to get it to work. Did you pass your launch readiness review? We did, somehow. I don't know how, but. Well, it sounds like me, you're ready to launch. Oh, we can't wait. And then we're going to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Hayes, a lot of teams had to overcome some obstacles to get here, uh, but unfortunately, you weren't able to overcome yours. What happened? So, uh, two weeks ago, we had a catastrophic failure within our motor. Uh, we blew out our aft booster section. Um, fortunately, our team was able to come together, and within the span of a week, we rebuilt our entire booster. And we were all set, ready to fly last Saturday. And unfortunately, we had a successful launch all the way up to about 1,500 feet, and our rocket started gyrating due to a slightly rushed manufacture process, because like I said, we just had a week to build. And our rocket essentially sheared itself apart to all its pieces, and we lost the booster section again. So, fortunately, we're not able to fly, but this is our first year here. We're, um, you know, we're very happy to be here. The process has been phenomenal, and uh, we're here to show our failures and show you know, that this is the rocketry industry, you know, that failure does sometimes happen, and you've got to be able to look at your failures and design around them and uh, come up with a way to prevent that. Now, the conditions that you have in Chicago or in Wisconsin where you test mm -hmm. versus here down in Alabama, they're polar opposites. Oh, totally. Are there any types of changes that you need to make to your rocket mm -hmm. uh, to compensate for the temperature? Yeah, well, we've definitely compensated um, for the humidity. And the, the temperature has had some effect on our rocket on the, the actual pieces sliding together. So we've just added some lubricants to make things move smoother, but you know, also like stay tight. And then we've made some um, ballast compensations for the thickness of the air because we uh, presume that's going to be different because Alabama is hugely humid and Chicago is pretty dry, mm -hmm. um, aside from the snow. <laughs> so, Sofian, you're an international exchange student from Tunisia. Yes. What kind of obstacles did you have to overcome? Well, obviously, uh, there was a personal and a technical challenge. The main challenge was to overcome the language barrier. So you have a team made of mainly U.S. citizens. And as an international student, I have to know how to communicate with them. That was hard in the beginning, but when you talk technical, like you talk solutions, everyone starts to understand each other. And that made us here today with, a, we can say, a very pretty solid rocket and pretty solid AGSE. So we could overcome those barriers easily with time. So Jordan, I understand your team doesn't have any veterans on it. You're kind of like a green team. Tell me a little bit about it. Yes, yes. We started out as a team composed of at least half freshmen and sophomore students that uh, have had no experience with a rocketry competition before. So we kind of had an interesting challenge tying everybody's talents and strengths and abilities together into a team that can match up against a lot of the other ones that we know are here that consists of, you know, primarily upperclassmen and graduate students. But you're here. Uh, we are here. Are you looking forward to a, a successful launch on Saturday? Absolutely. Our full-scale test launch went entirely perfect. Uh, we've only made one design change since then, and we anticipate a repeat performance, and hopefully, you know, we've inspired enough students to carry on this competition in following years and step up into leadership roles and keep Iowa State on the map. You know, I really love it that these students are already thinking about next year, future competitions. Yeah, if you're a returning team, it's really good to know the lay of the land. Absolutely, and for this competition, it is great to have access to this kind of environment where you can launch this many rockets and support all these teams. I had an opportunity to talk with Jeannie Bragg Harvey and hear all about how NASA was able to secure this awesome Alabama spaceport. 
Jeannie, thanks so much for allowing us to come onto this great property and hold this magnificent event. But I'm curious, how did you start your relationship with NASA to allow them to come out onto your farm and launch rockets? Well, I got this most random phone call out of the blue one day, several years ago. And as it turns out, someone at NASA had contacted the chairman of our county commission, and he had gone on and contacted my local commissioner who got in touch with me and put us together and um, it sounded interesting something i'd never heard of before certainly never been a part of before and just knew it was something we wanted to be a part of how did that first event go were, were you nervous how what, what happened i didn't not having been to one i didn't know what to expect but all the staff from NASA was really good about filling me in and cluing me in as to what types of things to expect. Went well, I believe it was the only event we've hosted thus far that has gone off as planned <laughs> on the days it was scheduled. April seems to be a month for rain, so um, and that always interferes. What kind of uh, weather situations actually cause problems from the farm standpoint for holding an event like this? Well, the rain can make it really mucky in the fields. We have a crop on the fields right now, so that's going to help a little bit. Cloud cover before an, a rain event or after can prevent launches due to low cloud decks. Wind, uh, this area is known for tornadic storms. We've not had that interfere with yet. But Very good. We keep eyes out for those things. Obviously, you have a lot of land, and that's important for this kind of thing. But uh, have you lost any rockets or anything over the years? Not permanently. There may have been a component that didn't get recovered, but we have had rockets go very far away and drift. And we've even gone up in airplanes looking for them after the fact and <laughs> have found a couple that way. But they do go off property. But you've recovered them all. No, none are still missing. as well. None are still missing. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> You've been very generous with your land and letting NASA come out for the event, but I know it has an impact on the farm. So what motivates you? Why keep being involved in the process? Well, it, it's kind of selfish reasons because I have two young children and the exposure that they get to this type of science and math, I can't give them here. I, and there's no way for me to teach it to them. And so it's a field trip, a literal field trip out our back door to come and have access to all this incredible stuff that these young folks are doing. Just to be able to walk from team to team and ask questions and dig deeper into what their payload experiments are or why they designed the rocket this way or that, they can't get it anywhere else but at an event like this. And so I'm happy to host it. Guys, it looks like Jeannie is working on a sequel to Astronaut Farmer. <laughs> it's funny, Franklin, but actually I think she'd make a great astronaut. I wonder if she submitted an application. Jeannie's not the only one that benefits from this event. We also want to hear what the students have taken away from the competition. Greg, what is the thing you like most about this competition? One of the things I think that makes this competition pretty unique is the aspect of being able to outreach with students of all ages. Part of the competition you're graded on is your educational engagement program. And we're very fortunate to have a good group at the university that kind of helps us set up these outreach programs where we spend many, many weeks, multiple months throughout the entire competition reaching out to hundreds of kids in middle school, grade school, high school, teaching them not only about rocketry, but you know how they can apply what they learn in school in real life situations. And you know, it's been interesting because you, you work with the, the younger kids and the older kids and it's, it's really easy to get people excited about rocketry but it's really something special when you see, you know, people start getting really into the STEM programs, math, science, you know, trying to pave a way for the, the generation behind us that can kind of, you know, follow in our footsteps. Since you've arrived here at the Math Challenge, you and other teams have had an opportunity to interact with the judges and the safety officials here. Through your interaction with them, have you received any tips or any information that has helped your team out? Definitely. They've been really helpful. They gave us a lot of great suggestions, uh, especially with maintaining the integrity of a lot of the rocket components that deal with the separation. For instance, our eye bolts connecting the safety harnesses and parachutes and things like that. They made us aware of the fact that sometimes those eye bolts can spin loose and you know you just lose a part of your rocket. They just told us some ways to ensure that doesn't happen and really thankful for that kind of stuff because those are problems we haven't encountered yet and you know thanks to them we probably won't ever encounter them. 
Okay, Alana, your team drove down here to Alabama from Northeastern. Tell me about your interesting trip. So we drove down from Boston. A straight drive would be about 20 hours, so we decided to break it up over the course of three days. And we camped in Virginia and the Great Smoky Mountains, and we've been working on assembling our AGSE and our tents on the way down. You guys just parked at the end of the day, set up tents. Set up the tents. And started working on your rocket in yep, the tents. Started pulling all the components out of the cars into the tents before the sun went down. That's roughing it. <laughs> hey, you gotta do what you gotta do. What is it about launch day that uh, gets you excited? Um, I think just seeing our full-scale rocket fly, you know, pushing that button, seeing the motor fire, seeing it um, hop off the pad. We have a lot of experience building rockets. We know, but we never built such a heavily autonomous system before. So there was a lot of robotics knowledge that we had to pick up along the way and learn and teach ourselves. And that was definitely a challenge for us that was very rewarding to overcome. It is great to see the enthusiasm and the look on the students' faces when they're successful. Yeah, because quite a few of them came a long way from the beginning of the week when they showed up. They were missing some parts, the rockets weren't working, but they know what they had to do, and at the end of the week, most of them successfully launched their rockets. Yeah, and they actually successfully burned a lot of calories recovering their rockets and hiking through the fields to bring them back, so quite a trek. Yeah, it's a good thing they had those trackers, because I'm going to tell you one thing, they would still be looking out there in those fields. I felt sorry for that one team that had their rocket with like 60 feet on top of a tree. Well, now the good news is NASA today was prepared to award three teams prize money. Unfortunately, only two teams qualified for the prize. So, for the first ever Centennial Challenge MAV prize, the second place winner is Tarleton State University. And first place for the MAV prize goes to... All right, fantastic. Let's go give some prize money, okay? Let's do this. You got everything, Janet? Got it. Okay, let's go. Congratulations, come on out. Fantastic. So I want to congratulate you on being the 2015 MAV Challenge Prize winners for $25,000 in first place. Excellent job, way to go, you guys. Fantastic. I gotta give out some more prize money. Have a great day, thank you.